What's up everybody? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to a new video as I cross the Fred Hartman Bridge in Baytown, Texas. You know, I knew somebody, she was like one of these tough chicks. You could come at her with a gun, with a knife, with a club of some kind, a katana sword. She wouldn't be scared, but if she had to cross this bridge, she was terrified. She thought that because the bridge was so high, the wind would actually lift up her mid-sized to compact car, lift it up and push it over at the same time, and the car would work its way in between these yellow poles, and she... <laughs> I'm not making this up. I'm like, are you... <laughs> Alright, enough about the Fred Hartman Bridge. Let's not waste any more time with this intro. Let's get to it. Let's get started. What's today's video gonna be about? Well, I'm gonna do story time and only story time because you deserve it. Okay, so let's do story time. Today's story time is about back when I was a plumber. Uh, I get a lot of good stories from that era of my life. So the thing that these two have in common is crazy customers. So the first one is, I was uh, going to a call, it was about six o'clock at night, so after hours, but not real late. And there, apparently the call was when they'd wash clothes, the drain line would back up. All right, so I show up and the house is kind of dark with just lamps on. And the lady greeted me at the door, she's like, hi. And then here comes the husband. You know, a lot of times when there's a service guy around, an AC man, electrician, a plumber, the husband's got to take over, you know, to be a big shot. So the lady just went out. She's watching TV. He starts telling me about how he used to have these pet bobcats. And I'm talking about the predatory cat with long, sharp claws and pointy teeth. But he had them as house pets. He would keep them in the house. Yeah, he had two of them. So he decides he's going to switch from deadly felines to deadly reptiles. So he starts showing me in the spare bedroom, he's got these big aquariums with these deadly snakes, you know, the kind that wrap themselves around you, boa constrictor or a python or anaconda or whatever. He's got several. I think one of them was an albino one. And he's got scorpions with like the black light on. I don't know if y'all know, but the scorpion shell, when you put a black light on it, it'll glow in the dark. I don't know what they call that, I'm not very smart. Phosphorescent, something like that. So he's got the aquarium with the sand and the phosphorescent light to recreate the scorpion's natural habitat, a rock or something. And I'm like, where's the washing machine? And here he comes with a wooden box. And he goes, you wanna see something? And in my mind, I'm going, no. So he puts down his cocktail, because he's drinking, of course, and he opens up the wooden box, and he's got a gun in there. I'm like, here we go. This guy's a little cuckoo, right? Or as we would say, throat off. He's got pet bobcats and deadly snakes. I'm not a reptile guy, but why would you want to own pets that you go to bed at night, and you wake up in the morning and find yourself dead because your pet killed you, you know? Now he's got a gun. I don't know what kind of gun it was. I'm not a gun guy, but it was a revolver, not the kind that you put a clip in. So I'm thinking just please, as long as he leaves the gun in the box. Well, of course he's got to show me. Oh, look at this. And he pulls the gun out. Don't worry. It's not loaded. Now, like I said, I'm not smart. In fact, I'm remarkably stupid, but I know one thing. And the one thing I know is there ain't no such thing as an unloaded gun. He's waving it around and it's pointing at me and I mean he's not pointing it at me but he's the bar is that they call it the barrel the business end of the gun is pointing at me at times and he's drinking and he's cuckoo so I I was just like please get me out he had to show me because it was a nice gun it had like a wooden handle with some etching or engraving some little filigree on it oh look I'm like okay now I have to pretend that I'm 
interested in this so as not to offend him. And he'll be, he'll end up before he's pointing it at me for real. Okay, so I got out of that unscathed. Fine. The next one is another customer. I told y'all in a previous story time that in New Orleans, if a pipe under your house breaks, they don't jackhammer down and fix it from the top. We dig a tunnel under your house and fix it from underneath. It's very profitable, so the company I was with made me a tunnel salesman. I would go give an estimate, set up the digging crew, set up the plumber, maybe make a parts list, whatever it takes. There was two of us that did that. So this wasn't my job, but the other guy, Henry was his name, he's like, hey, can you go set up the diggers for me? I can't make it. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I show up and I'm showing the diggers where to go. Here comes the man of the house. God forbid if I ever get married, I don't know, I don't know all the rules, you know. Of course, here comes the husband. And he's got a flannel shirt, jeans, and boots, and he's got one of these like handlebar mustaches. And you gotta remember, this is like 15 years ago before they had hipsters. Bef like, if you had a mustache like that, you were kind of like a little bit crazy. Nowadays, you're just a hipster. You know, you got some sort of Monopoly Man mustache and a gluten sensitivity, or a Mr. Pringles Man mustache, you know what I'm saying? But back then, if you had that kind of mustache, you were cuckoo, right? And at a certain point, I had to leave to go check on another job. Come back, here comes the guy again, only now he's got him a little cocktail. And he's got a gun on his hip and a holster. And I'm thinking, here we go, man. He's, and I'm not, when I say drinking, he ain't drinking beer. He ain't drinking some little fruity drink. I'm talking brown liquor, right? And he would finish one, go back in, get him another one. And he's like telling these stories. And he's got all these like outrageous, fantastical stories about, as a little side note, I'm one of the last generation of people in New Orleans who have heard stories about Carlos Marcelo. So he was the mafia boss in New Orleans from like, oh, the late 40s until he died in 1993. Nobody talks about him anymore. He's been dead for 30 years. But I still heard stories about him growing up and as a young adult. Everybody in New Orleans had some story of their connection or alleged connection to Carlos Marcelo. Like their dad used to play cards with them. Or my uncle used to uh, work on his car. My mama used to wash his dirty drawers. Everybody had a story about how they were affiliated with him. Most of them lies. So this guy starts telling me how he used to take care of Carlos Marcelo's horses. He'd feed the horses and clean up the horse shit or whatever. And he also, every now and then, he had to get a little rough, right? He was like a mob enforcer. At best, it's a gross exaggeration. At worst, it's an outright lie. So he's telling me about he's a former mob. He didn't say hitman, but you know, he'd get rough with some guys. I don't know. He's got a gun and he's drinking. And the more he drinks, the more drunk he gets. And you know how some drunks, whenever they get drunk, they're like cool and laid back. And some drunks, when they get drunk, they're really aggressive and violent. Well, he was the latter, not the former. And he's like making himself angry. He's just getting loud. And he's he's just getting angry at nothing. I'm just sitting there going, yeah, 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 sure. And the digger, we're looking at each other like, man, what's up with this guy? I can't overstate like how aggressive and angry he was getting. And how, remember, drinking, guns, and angry, that's not a good combination. And the fact that he made himself angry makes it even worse. And so we were, we were worried, to say the least. Well, I had to leave again. Remember, time has passed. He's been drinking. I had to go check on another customer. So I pulled the digger to the side because I felt kind of responsible. Normally, I wouldn't even be there because the diggers are doing their thing. But I felt responsible for the diggers because I hired him. And I felt I needed a buffer between... You know, Remember the Godfather, Willie Chi Chi? He was like, yeah, Senator. The family had a lot of buffers. Right, yeah, a buffer. The family had a lot of buffers. <laughs> so I wanted to be a buffer between crazy drunk guy with a gun and the diggers. So I was like, just focus on me. Well, I had to leave, so I told the digger, I said, look, man, 
something's wrong with this guy. And he's like, I know. He's got a gun, he's drunk, and he's really mad for no reason. I said, if he comes and talks to you, everything is yes, sir, no, sir. If he's got a gripe or a complaint, just say, we're really sorry, sir. We're going to take care of it. But really, get in your van, get you guys, and just go. I'll deal with them when I get back. Okay, man, I appreciate it. Yeah, this guy is, I'm scared. I'm like, all right, just remember, yes, sir, no, sir, be polite. All right, I get back. Lo and behold, the guy got so drunk, he fell asleep. Well, of course, when I get back, the diggers are cleaning up their stuff, and here he comes with another cocktail. And uh, it's like, all right, so we're out of here. We're going to send uh, the plumber tomorrow to make the repair, and you'll be all fixed up. And you'll be dealing with Henry again from here on out. <laughs> As a side note, I mentioned the previous guy's wife, how she was nice. This lady would come out offering us lemonade and stuff. Super sweet. And I started thinking, what's with these women who are sweet as pie, but they're married to these lunatics with guns and drinking problems? You know what I'm saying? The other thing I thought is, if some guy who's drunk and crazy, a little cuckoo, walks up to you with a box and says, hey, you, <laughs> you want to see what's in my box? That's about the same as a guy walking up to me and saying, hey, you want to see what's in my pants? No, I don't want to see what what's in your box or your pants. Okay, anyway, those are my stories about my crazy customers. We had a little diversion into New Orleans mafia life and everything like that. So I hope you enjoyed these stories. I know I've deprived y'all for a long time and I hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope to see you on the next video. But until then, this is Jason, signing out. The bonus footage is, it's a little one minute and 45 second clip of Carlos Marcelo testifying in front of some, I guess it was like a Senate subcommittee on organized crime. They probably subpoenaed him. Now you know that these guys can't actually answer questions. So he's putting on a clinic on how to answer the question without actually answering it, but also without making it look like he's being coy or intentionally dodging the question. He's trying to make it look like he's making an earnest effort to answer the question. Essentially, he's playing dumb. And you can see towards the end of the video, the senator starts to get frustrated with him. The only setup here is that the senator's asking him about his occupation, which is listed on his tax return as, as a tomato salesman. <laughs> a tomato salesman. So the first question that you can't hear is the senator asks him, who do you sell tomatoes to? A lot of fruit and Stores. Your testimony is that the last five or six years you've been going around to grocery stores in the New Orleans area and selling tomatoes. I've been to fruit stands and <laughs> When was the last time you were Just to fruit, fruit stand? stands to sell tomatoes? Uh, fruit stand last week. To sell tomatoes? Well, not exactly. I go there to see them. See how they're doing and, uh, I bought some fruits myself. In other words, you were just shopping for some fruit yourself. Yes. I'm asking you how you're supposed to be earning money according to the information you give the internal revenue of 20000 approximately a year yes. selling tomatoes. $20,000 a year where do you sell these as tomatoes? a tomato salesman. Supermarkets and grocery stores, fruit stands. All right, would you tell <laughs> us the last sale that you made to a supermarket? The last sale I made? Yeah. I don't make sales every day. I just, they're a customer of mine. You, you said there are customers in yours. Would you name the, the, the largest customer you have? Well, they're all large. I couldn't tell you unless I looked at the book. All right, would you tell me one of the customers that you sell tomatoes to? And you're in this business for six years, you're telling the Internal Revenue uh, Service that you've been selling tomatoes. The senator's getting frustrated at this tomatoes. point. Isn't it a fact that it's a phony job? You don't sell tomatoes at all? This is yeah. just a way of legitimizing illegal no. income? No, sir, it's not a phony job. All right, then tell me who you sell the tomatoes to. I sell to a lot of people in your office. You haven't been able to mention one. Is that the best or what? I mean, is he a mob boss or a tomato? I think he might have actually been a tomato salesman. He's got a lot of customers. Grocery stores, supermarkets, to fruit stands. <laughs> and he just keeps saying it. Where do you sell your tomatoes? Grocery stores, supermarkets, tomatoes. Oh, absolutely love it. 
The other thing some of y'all might have noticed is his accent. Sadly, that accent is dying out. And you can hear it especially um, when he says supermarkets um, or New Orleans. Um, even the word new, like New Orleans. And then the famous one when he said he goes check on his customers to see how they're doing. <laughs> And you just, I don't know, depends on who you talk to, but you rarely hear that anymore. So uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And please go buy some tomatoes.